This is your well-rested host, Eddie Muller, welcoming you back to Noir Alley, that detour off the cinematic highway where nothing ever goes according to plan. We emerge from our two-month hiatus with a rarity on the resume of a director who, in my opinion, was Hollywood's finest maker of film noir, Robert C. Admack. It's The File on Thelma Jordan, released in 1949 by Paramount Pictures. The great Barbara Stanwyck stars in a film tailored expressly for her by producer Hal Wallace. They'd scored a big hit the previous year with Sorry Wrong Number, and Wallace was hoping to catch lightning in a bottle again, this time by having Stanwyck directed by the guy who'd made some of the best crime and suspense pictures of the 40s, Robert C. Admack. Things like Phantom Lady, The Killers, and Cry of the City. This film recalls a couple of earlier noirs, Double Indemnity and The Strange Love of Martha Ivers, movies that set Stanwyck on course to become the queen of noir. Once again, she plays a strong, ruthless, morally compromised woman. When Thelma entices married assistant DA Cleve Marshall, played by Wendell Corey, into an illicit affair, does she have something even more sinister up her sleeve? It's notable that in Robert C. Admack films, the protagonists are often women, as is the case with Phantom Lady, Christmas Holiday, The Dark Mirror, and Thelma Jordan. Fully developed female characters are also featured in his other noirs. The Suspect, The Strange Affair of Uncle Harry, The Spiral Staircase, and Criss Cross. So it's no surprise that Thelma Jordan's story is the work of two women. The story is by Marty Holland, a one-time secretary at 20th Century Fox, whose first published novel was made into the 1945 noir Fallen Angel. Mary Holland chose to sign her work as Marty, figuring a man's name might increase her chances for success. Thelma Jordan's screenplay is by Catherine Hartley, a former journalist who started her Hollywood career writing the original story for 1941's Hold Back the Dawn. She did not share in the resulting Oscar nomination that Billy Wilder and Charles Brackett earned for Best Screenplay. Under the name Ketty Frings, Hartley wrote the stories or final scripts for a dozen or so films in the 40s before turning to playwriting in the 1950s, culminating in the 1958 Pulitzer Prize for her Broadway adaptation of Thomas Wolfe's Look Homeward Angel. I figure a Pulitzer Prize more than makes up for an Oscar snub. Holland and Frings refocused a fairly common noir plot to make the file on Thelma Jordan decidedly different than your straight-ahead murder mystery. While there are signature elements of a typical film noir, love affair, a murder and its cover-up, double crosses and betrayals, it's also something of a meditation on love and marriage. By this point in his Hollywood career, Robert C. Admack had pretty much perfected the plot-heavy, visually stylish crime film. With Thelma Jordan, he slows things down a bit focusing as much on the characters' relationships as he does on the story's criminal elements. Of course, director of photography George Barnes brings a sufficiently shadowy look to the proceedings, so I have no hesitation calling this the final full-fledged noir in Robert C. Admack's exceptional Hollywood filmography. Wendell Corey was a Hal Wallace discovery since his 1947 debut in Desert Fury, had become one of the busiest actors in the business. This was the first time he'd play a leading man, albeit one flawed in the finest and most futile noir tradition. The film also features a wonderful cast of supporting players, including Paul Kelly, Joan Tetzel, Stanley Ridges, Barry Kelly, and Richard Rober. From one of the preeminent producers of film noir, directed by the genre's greatest stylist, and starring its most formidable actress. Here is The File on Thelma Jordan. Wendell Corey was totally convincing playing drunk on screen, but unfortunately the time came when, like Cleve says early in the film, he couldn't say another word without a drink. After playing supporting roles for 15 years, Corey's interest increasingly turned to politics. He served on the board of the Screen Actors Guild, was president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences between 1961 and 63, served on the Santa Monica City Council, 
and campaigned unsuccessfully for a Republican congressional seat. All the while, he dealt with a worsening addiction to alcohol, which finally killed him in 1968, at only 54 years of age. All in all, Corey's film career lasted only 20 years, but he left behind an indelible array of characters, mostly in crime dramas and thrillers. The file on Thelma Jordan would be director Robert C. Admas, last Hollywood noir. He returned to Europe to make The Crimson Pirate in 1951, and although the finished film was a rousing success, both artistically and financially, the Admac was treated so miserably by star Burt Lancaster, who was also the producer, that he decided to abandon Hollywood. There was a sour end to a professional relationship that had begun in 1946 with The Killers, the picture that made Lancaster a star. The Admac sold his house in Beverly Hills to James Mason, moved to Paris, and never made another picture in the States. He continued making movies in Europe for the next 16 years, many of which are still awaiting rediscovery and revival. As for Barbara Stanwyck, she was in the midst of a 15-year run filled with noir-stained starring roles. With a half dozen noir classics already under her belt by 1950, she still had more ahead. Films like No Man of Her Own, Witness to Murder, and Crime of Passion. Whether she was playing the victim or the vixen, Stanwyck always made flesh and blood women out of even the most sketchily written characters. Speaking of making the most of a character, that's what Stanley Ridges does with the role of defense attorney Kingsley Willis. His client consultation with Stanwyck is an acting master class, a scene of fantastically sinister understatement probably the best scene in the film. It's always amusing to see veteran actor Paul Kelly portraying an authority figure, whether it's a prosecuting attorney or a homicide detective. That's because Kelly was one of the few performers to have actually served time for killing someone. In 1927, he was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced up to 10 years in San Quentin. He'd beaten to death the husband of actress Dorothy Mackay, with whom he was having an affair. Kai was also sentenced to prison for her role in the killing. While still in stir, she wrote a play about her experiences, which became the 1933 film Ladies They Talk About, in which Mackay was played by Barbara Stanwyck. Kelly served just over two years in prison and eventually resumed his acting career, which included the 1954 film Duffy of San Quentin, in which he played... Clinton T. Duffy, the real-life warden of San Quentin from 1940 to 1952. Some of you probably recognized actress Casey Rogers, who played Cleve Marshall's secretary. Her most famous role was as Farley Granger's ill-fated wife in Strangers on a Train. She's billed in this film, as in Strangers, as Laura Elliott, a name she only had for the few years she was under contract to Paramount. Joan Tetzel turned in a good performance as Cleve's fed-up wife, Pam. Native New Yorker had worked on stage and radio during the 40s, but had just begun her movie career with roles in Duel in the Sun and The Paradine Case. She'd be mostly known for her later stage work, highlighted by her portrayal of Nurse Ratched in the original 1963 Broadway production of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, opposite Kirk Douglas. Next week, I'll have a picture starring Barbara Stanwyck's main rival for the mantle, Queen of Noir. Joan Crawford stars with Sidney Greenstreet and Zachary Scott in Flamingo Road, directed by the great Michael Curtiz. In the meantime, let us know what you thought of today's film on the Noir Alley Facebook page or Twitter feed. Till next time, see you in the shadows.